Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 33, with our book today, The 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos. And I quote from the 42nd parallel by John Dos Passos. Faney lived 10 years in Chicago. At first, he went to school and played baseball on back lots on Saturday afternoons, but then came his last commencement and all the children sang my country tis of thee and school was over and he had to go to work. Uncle Tim, at that time, had his own job printing shop on a dusty side street off North Clark on the ground floor of a cranky old brick building. It only occupied a small section of the building that was mostly used as a warehouse and was famous for its rats. It had a single wide plate glass window made resplendent by gold, old English lettering, Timothy O'Hara, job printer. Now, Fanny Old Sport said Uncle Tim, you'll have a chance to learn the profession from the ground up. So he ran errands, delivered packages of circulars, throwaways, posters, was always dodging trolley cars, ducking from under the foamy bits of big truck horses, bumming rides on delivery wagons. When there were no errands to run, he swept out under the presses, cleaned type, emptied the office waste paper basket, or during rush times ran round the corner for coffee and sandwiches for the typesetter or for a small flask of bourbon for... Uncle Tim. Pop puttered around on his crutch for several years, always looking for a job. Evenings, he smoked his pipe and cursed his luck on the back stoop of Uncle Tim's house and occasionally threatened to go back to Middletown. Then one day he got pneumonia and died quietly at the Sacred Heart Hospital. It was about the same time Uncle Tim bought a linotype machine. Uncle Tim was so excited he didn't take a drink for three days. The floorboards were so rotten they had to build a brick base for the linotype all the way up from the cellar. Well, when we get another one, we'll concrete the whole place, Uncle Tim told everybody. For a whole day, there was no work done. Everybody stood around looking at the tall, black, intricate machine that stood there like an organ in a church. When the machine was working and the print shop filled with a hot smell of molten metal, everybody's eyes followed the quivering, inquisitive arm that darted and flexed above the keyboard. When they handed round the warm, shiny slugs of type, the old German typesetter, who for some reason they called Mike, pushed back his glasses on his forehead and cried, 55 years a printer, and now when I'm old, I'll have to carry Haas to make a living. The first print Uncle Tim set up on the new machine was the phrase, Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose uh, but your chains. When Fanny was 17 and just beginning to worry about skirts and ankles and girls' underwear, when he walked home from work in the evening and saw the lights of the city bright against the bright, heady western sky, there was a strike in the Chicago printing trades. Tim O'Hara had always run a union shop and did all the union printing at cost. He even got up a handbill signed, A Citizen, entitled An Earnest Protest, which Faney was allowed to set up on the linotype one evening after the operator had gone home. One phrase stuck in Faney's mind, and he repeated it to himself after he had gone to bed that night. It is time for all honest men to band together to resist the ravages of greedy privilege.
everything we've built in the last 30 years of the internet has convinced us regular people of a new hubristic lie. Like the heathen kings of old, we have somehow built a right to never be forgotten by the future. But no one reads our author today. No one, from what I hear over my email correspondence with others who have talked about or written about this author, no one reads John Dos Passos anymore. From the introduction to the 42nd parallel, the Mariner Books edition, uh, the introduction written by that famous author who soon will join the pantheon of Dos Passos, E.L. Doctoro. I will quote extensively today on the podcast, and I will begin by quoting directly. Given neither to He-Man aesthetics like Hemingway, nor to the romance of self-destruction like Fitzgerald, John Dos Passos, their friend and contemporary, he was born in 1896, was a modest, self-effacing person, an inveterate wanderer who liked to hike through foreign places and sit down for a drink with strangers and listen to their stories. He saw literature as reportage. He admired the plain style of Defoe, and he read Thackeray's Vanity Fair, subtitled, A Novel Without a Hero, All His Life. Dos Passos was born wandering, living out his lonely childhood with his unmarried mother, Lucy Madison, as she toured the European capitals to avoid scandal, while in the United States, his father, John R. Dos Passos, an eminent corporate lawyer and lobbyist, waited for his invalided first wife to die. When that event came about in 1910, the mother, the father, and the boy, a strongly loving triad, were finally able to constitute themselves as a family. But the isolation of his early life left Dos Passos psychologically detached with feelings of a perpetual outsider. The outside, of course, is a position of advantage for a writer. Reportage from the outside and slightly above is the working viewpoint of Dos Passos' masterpiece, USA which we are reading on the podcast today. It is a nice irony that not the era's big literary personalities, but this quiet, inhibited young man would produce the most vaultingly ambitious novel of all, a 1,200-page chronicle of the historic and spiritual life of an entire country in the first three decades of the 20th century. Not for him the portrait of a gangster, however metaphorically shimmering, or even the group portrait of a lost generation. Dos Passos goes wide, from the American incursion in the Philippines to the beginning of the talkies, from coast to coast and class to class. USA is the novel as mural, with society's heroes standing out from the flames of history, while the small-figured masses toil at their feet. In fact, the peripatetic Dos Passos landed one day in Mexico City and was much taken with the murals of Diego Rivera, colorfully spreading story after story up the courtyard walls of the Secretariat of Education. In later years, he indicated also his love of 13th and 14th century European tableau. Those with the saints painted big and the ordinary people painted small, filling up the background. Close quote, once again from E.L. Doctoro, his introduction to the Mariner edition of the 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos. All those reasons that Doctoro lists in his introduction here um, is much the reason why, though there are societies dedicated to the reading of his work, and though there are awards for literature given out in his name, Almost now, over a hundred years on, John Dos Passos is being forgotten. Slowly and surely, even as the roiling, tumultuous USA he described in his trilogy continues to roil and roll right on. The only difference is that now, unlike at the time of his writing, the quote-unquote small-figured masses have more access to more opportunities to move themselves to the foreground of the epic tableau that is American life. What does this say about leadership, about followership, and about who gets remembered 
and who gets forgotten? All of those questions we will explore on this, the first part of our three-part podcast series covering John Dos Passos's The USA Trilogy with the 42nd Parallel today. Back to the 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos. Big Bill Haywood was born in 69 in a boarding house in Salt Lake City. He was raised in Utah, got his schooling in Ophir, a mining camp with shooting scrapes, Pharaoh Saturday nights, whiskey spilled on poker tables piled with new silver dollars. When he was 11, his mother bound him out to a farmer. He ran away because the farmer lashed him with a whip. That was his first strike. He lost an eye whittling a slingshot out of scrub oak. He worked for storekeepers and ran a fruit stand, ushered in the Salt Lake Theater, was a messenger boy, bellhop at the Continental Hotel. When he was 15, he went out to the mines in Humboldt County, Nevada. His outfit was overalls, a jumper, a blue shirt, mining boots, two pairs of blankets, a set of chessmen, boxing gloves, and a big lunch of plum pudding his mother fixed for him. When he married, he went to live in Fort McDermott, built in the old days against the Indians, abandoned now that there was no more frontier. There, his wife bore their first baby without doctor or midwife. Bill cut the navel string. Bill buried the afterbirth. The child lived. Bill earned money as he could, surveying, haying in Paradise Valley, breaking colts, riding a wide, rangy country. One night at Thompson's Mill, he was one of five men who met by chance and stopped the night in the abandoned ranch. Each of them had lost an eye. They were the only one-eyed men in the county. They lost the homestead. Things went to pieces. His wife was sick. He had children to support. He went to work as a miner at Silver City. At Silver City, Idaho, he joined the WFM. There he felt held his first union office. He was delegate of the Silver City Miners to the Convention of the Western Federation of Miners, held in Salt Lake City in 1898. From then on, he was an organizer, a speaker, and exhorter. The wants of all the miners were his wants. He fought Coeur d'Alene's Telluride, Cripple Creek, joined the Socialist Party, wrote and spoke through Idaho, Utah, Nevada, Montana, Colorado, to miners striking for an eight-hour day, better living, a share of the wealth they hacked out of the hills. In Chicago, January 1905, a conference was called that met at the same hall in Lake Street where the Chicago anarchists had addressed meetings 20 years before. William D. Haywood was permanent chairman. It was his conference that wrote the manifesto that brought into being the IWW. When he got back to Denver, he was kidnapped to Idaho and tried with Moyer and Pettibone for the murder of the shepherder Stuenberg, ex-governor of Idaho, blown up by a bomb in his own home. When they were acquitted at Boise, Darrow was their lawyer. Bill, Big Bill Haywood was known as a working class leader from coast to coast. Now the wants of all the workers were his wants. He was the spokesman of the West, of the cowboys and the lumberjacks and the harvest hands and the miners. The steam drill had thrown thousands of miners out of work. The steam drill had thrown a scare into all the miners of the West. The WFM was going conservative. Haywood worked with the IWW, building a new society in the shell of the old, campaigned for Debs for president in 1908 on the Red Special. He was in on all the big strikes in the East where revolutionary spirit was growing. Lawrence, Patterson, the strike of the Minnesota iron workers. 
They went all over with the AEF to save Morgan Loans, to save Wilsonian democracy. They stood at Napoleon's tomb and dreamed empire. They had champagne cocktails at the Ritz Bar and slept with Russian countesses in Montmartre and dreamed empire all over the country at American Legion posts and businessmen's luncheons. It was worth money to make the eagle scream. They lynched the pacifists and the pro-Germans and the wobblies and the reds and the Bolsheviks. Bill Haywood stood trial with the 101 at Chicago where Judge Landis, the baseball czar with the lack of formality of a traffic court, handed out his 20-year sentences and $30,000 fines. After two years in Leavenworth, they let them bail out Big Bill. He was 50 years old, a heavy, broken man. The war was over, but they learned empire in the Hall of Mirror at Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. The courts refused a new trial. It was up to Haywood to jump his bail or to go back to prison for 20 years. He was sick with diabetes. He had had a rough life. Prison had broken down his health. Russia was a workers' republic. He went to Russia and was in Moscow a couple of years, but he wasn't happy there. That world was too strange for him. He died there, and they burned his big, broken hulk of a body and buried the ashes under the Kremlin wall. Most of your followers as a leader don't know who the mayor is in their own town. And this is something that leaders have to be aware of. They have to, they have to pay attention to this fact. They, uh, well, they sometimes miss this because, well, if they don't know who the mayor of their own town is, they may not even know who you are as a leader. They may merely think of you as a manager and a supervisor. That's somewhat of what you pull from Dos Passos writings. And John was an ardent progressive leftist in the early part of the 20th century. And this came about because of the life he lived and the background he hailed from and the injustices he observed. Leaders like Big Bill Haywood serve as stand-ins for moral and political ideals that roiled the country at the time of Dos Passos' writing, and only around 20 years after Nietzsche's death and in the midst of the building of a Leninist-inspired paradise on top of all of those bones in a gulag, the consequences of the impact of the ideas of supermen, Marxist paradises, and socialist reform had yet to grow the long, cynical strain they would adopt as the century progressed in the USA. So Dos Passos wrote from a position of all of this being new, all of this being interesting. He wrote from a position where you needed to know who your mayor was and you needed to know whether your mayor was socialist or whether your mayor was not. And that even transliterated down to whether your CEO, whether your manager was socialist and would let you go on strike or whether your manager was unreformed and an unrepentant capitalist. From E.L. Doctoro, from the introduction to the Mariner edition of the 42nd Parallel, and I quote, he published his first installment of USA, the 42nd Parallel, in 1929, having realized early on that what he was doing could not be contained in just one volume. In, 1930, in 1919, the book, uh, followed two years later, and the final volume, The Big Money, was published in 1936. He could have gone on. He had endless resources for the thing, having picked up its rhythm and much of the material from his own ambulating life. He'd gone up from Baltimore to Harvard, where he read and was impressed by the Imagist poets, Ezra Pound, Amy Lowell, Carl Sandburg. He also made his acquaintance with the works of James Joyce, the 
20th century writer who, though hardly given to English plain speech, would have the most enduring influence on him. After Harvard, he went back to his wandering, spending a year in Spain and studying architecture. But World War I was just over the border, and in 1916, he volunteered to drive for the Norton Harges Ambulance Service, the same organization for which Hemingway and E.E. E. Cummings drove. He served in France and Italy, and then with the entry of America into the conflict, he enlisted in the AEF, that would be the American Expeditionary Force, and, all told, got as much of a dose of modern war as he would need for the inspiration to portray its soldier victims in his very first novel, Three Soldiers, published in 1921. This reticent writer was always disposed to the action. In the post-war 20s, he managed time and again to place himself in history's hot spots, where there are the literary scene in New York and Paris, revolutionary Mexico after the death of Emiliano Zapata, the newly communist Soviet Union or the nativist city of Boston, where he marched for the two imprisoned and condemned immigrant activists, I'm sorry, immigrant anarchists, not activists, immigrant anarchists, Sacco and, Van, and Vanzetti. He was writing all the time, of course. He published Rosanante to the Road Again in 1922, a book of essays about Spain. Uh, Manhattan Transfer, 1925, a dark impressionist portrait of New York and technical precursor of the USA novels, and pieces in the new masses, The Dial, The Nation, and The New Republic, attesting to his leftist sensibility. He was a diarist and kept up an active correspondence with a variety of colleagues, including Edmund Wilson, uh, more on him later, Malcolm Cowley, Ernest Hemingway, and of course Fitzgerald, all of them worried in the world, all of them news junkies, arguing politics and entangling themselves in the crises of civilization. Unquote. Hmm. Entangling themselves in the crises of civilization. I know it seems with our social media driven world that we all do this now. Um, and it seems as though the volume has been turned up. I was talking with someone today even about that. But with the full realization of that hoary progressive ideal, first promulgated by writers and intellectuals like Dos Passos in the 1920s, that quote unquote, the personal is political, leaders have now reached the end of an exhausting road where the average follower of a leader has two choices. Uh, one of two choices. Stop paying attention to the political totally or allow the political to permeate every single choice and action available in the world today. And of course, with an explosion of choices, you get an explosion for options for the political to show up everywhere. Either choice, if we're honest, and Despasos again was at the beginning, writing at the beginning of all this, what he would think of this now is up for debate. But either choice now in 2022 renders a narrow intellect, if we're to be honest, and is thin gruel for the soul where the passion that used to be exported to official traditional religious practices is now exported to social media feeds where the exhausted masses can continue to quote unquote entangle themselves in the crises of civilization. Much to leaders dismay. Back to the 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos. Uh, we're reading, as I said before, the, uh, the uh, volume one of the USA Trilogy, and this is uh, the Mariner Books version. Um, you can find several different versions of this book floating around, um, but uh, this first Mariner Books edition was published in the year 2000, and uh, and so we are we are almost exactly like uh, like we read there. We're almost exactly 103 some odd years um, ahead in time of this, um, and of course it was published by uh, by Houghton Mifflin Company, um, who who do still own the uh, who do still own the copyright, even though they've been acquired. Um, 
I would encourage you to go out and pick it up. And we're, when, as we cover um, the USA trilogy, the 42nd parallel really sets the tone for the remainder of the books in the trilogy, and it is worth reading and picking up. It's a quick read, by the way. It moves quite quickly, and those of us who live in a social media-driven era uh, will actually appreciate the structure of the book. We'll talk about that in just a second. But first, I'd like to, well, introduce you to another character in 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos. And I quote, When she was small, she hated everything. She hated her father, a stout, red-haired man smelling of whiskers and stale pipe tobacco. He worked in an office in the stockyards and came home with the stockyard stench on his clothes and told bloody jokes about butchering sheep and steers and hogs and men. Eleanor hated smells and the sight of blood. Nights she used to dream she lived alone with her mother in a big, clean white house in Oak Park in winter when there was snow on the ground and she'd been setting a white linen tablecloth with bright white silver and she'd set white flowers and the white meat of chicken before her mother who was a society lady in a dress of white samite but there'd suddenly be a tiny red speck on the table and it would grow and grow and grow and her mother would make helpless fluttering motions with her hands and she'd try to brush it off but it would grow to a spot of blood welling into a bloody blot spreading over the tablecloth and she'd wake up out of the nightmare smelling the stockyards and screaming when she was 16 in high school, she and a girl named Isabel swore together that if a boy ever touched them, they'd kill themselves. But that fall, the girl got pneumonia after scarlet fever and died. The only other person Eleanor liked was Ms. Oliphant, her English teacher. Ms. Oliphant had been born in England. Her parents had come to Chicago when she was a girl in her teens. She was a great enthusiast for the English language, tried to get her pupils to use the broad A, and felt that she had a right to some authority in matters pertaining to English literature, due to being distantly related to a certain Mrs. Oliphant, who'd been an English literary lady in the middle 19th century and had written so beautifully about Florence. So she'd occasionally have her more promising pupils, those who seemed the children of nicer parents, to tea in her little flat where she lived all alone with a sleepy blue Persian cat and a bullfinch and talk to them about Goldsmith and Dr. Johnson's pithy sayings and Keats and Corcordium and how terrible it was he died so young and Tennyson and how rude he'd been to women and about how they changed the guard at Whitehall and the grapevine Henry VIII planted at Hampton Court and the ill-fated Mary Queen of Scots. Ms. Oliphant's parents had been Catholics, and they had considered the Stuarts the rightful heirs to the British throne, and used to pass their wine glasses over the water pitcher when they drank to the king. All this thrilled the boys and girls very much, and particularly Eleanor and Isabel, and Ms. Oliphant used to give them high grades for their compositions and encourage them to read. Eleanor was very fond of her and very attentive in class. Just to hear Miss Oliphant pronounce a phrase like the great monuments of English prose or the little princesses in the tower or St. George and Mary England made small chills go up and down her spine. When Isabel died, Miss Oliphant was so lovely about it, had her to tea with her all alone and read her Lycidas in a clear, crisp voice and told her to read Adonais when she got home, but that she couldn't read it to her because she knew She'd break down if she did. Then she talked about her best friend when she'd been a girl who'd been an Irish girl with red hair and a clear, warm, white skin like Crown Darby, my dear, and how she'd gone to India and died of the fever and how Miss Oliphant had never thought to survive her grief and how Crown Darby had been invented and the inventor had spent his last penny working on the formula for this wonderful china and had needed some gold as a last ingredient and they had been starving to death and there had been nothing left but his wife's wedding ring and how they kept the fire and the furnace going with their chairs and tables and at last he produced this wonderful china that the royal family used exclusively. It was Miss Oliphant who induced Eleanor to take courses at the Art Institute. She had reproductions on her walls of pictures by Rossetti and Burne Jones and talked to Eleanor about the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood. She made her feel that art was something ivory white and very pure and noble and distant and sad. When her mother died of pernicious anemia, Eleanor was a thin girl of 18 
working days in a lace shop in the loop and studying commercial art evenings at the art institute after the funeral she went home and packed her belongings and moved to the moody house she hardly ever went to see her father he sometimes called her up on the phone but whenever she could she avoided answering she wanted to forget all about him Most of your followers will not understand how or why you decided to climb to the top, quote unquote, of an organization. And as we can see from his construction of the beginnings of the social climber known as Eleanor Stoddard, John Dos Passos viewed climbing to the top of the American hierarchy with a jaded eye, similar to the way that many do now. The characters of Eleanor Stoddard, uh, J.W. Morehouse, and others in the 42nd Parallel are what used to be known as social climbers, leveraging whatever tools <clears throat> are at their disposal or were at their disposal to attain status and to ruthlessly maintain status once it was acquired. Social climbers stand out particularly in a culture like America that ruthlessly works both to project social status and hide it all at the same time. Unlike other societies and cultures, uh, the USA has developed a culture that is both unaware and, by the same token, hyper-aware of the presence and differences between classes and, of course, class structure. And yet, before the ultimate socially climbing presidential family, the Roosevelts, there was very little political policy prescriptions that sought to either level out or increase the subtle differences between classes. Thus, there has always been in America the lack of a true political socialist movement, much less a Marxist class revolution in the mode of early 20th century Russia, much to the chagrin of intellectuals like Dos Passos and others, both then and oddly enough, even now. And that's because what both the social climbers and the revolutionaries fail to remember is that human beings enjoy the climb up the hierarchy. They enjoy the freedom to choose whether to climb, to tear down, to ignore, or to forge a totally different hierarchy. Or, you know, whatever. And the system that provides human beings with the most freedom to choose is the system that will survive the longest before the decay of ignorance, the obsequiousness of ignorance, or the chaos of revolution fully ends that system's existence on Earth. Back to the book, back to the 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos. Once again, the Mariner Books Edition with an introduction by E.L. Doctoro. And I quote, When Minor C. Keith died, all the newspapers carried his picture. A bright-eyed man with a hawk nose and a respectable bay window and an uneasy look under the eyes. Meyer C. Keith was a rich man's son, born in a family that liked the smell of money. They could smell money halfway around the globe in that family. His uncle was Henry Miggs, the Don Enrique of the West Coast. His father had a big lumber business and handled real estate in Brooklyn. Young Keith was a chip off the old block. Back in 49, Don Enrique had been drawn to San Francisco by the gold rush. He didn't go prospecting in the hills. He didn't die of thirst sifting alkali dust in Death Valley. He sold outfits to the other guys. 
He stayed in San Francisco and played politics and high finance until he got in too deep and had to get aboard a ship in a hurry. The vessel took him to Chile. He could smell money in Chile. He was the capitalista Yankee. He built the railroads from Santiago to Valparaiso. There were guano deposits in the Xinja Islands. Megs could smell money in guano. He dug himself a fortune out of guano, became a power on the West Coast, juggled figures, railroads, armies, the politics of the local caciques and politicos. They were all chips in a huge poker game. Behind a big hand, he heaped up the dollars. He financed the unbelievable Andean railroads. When Tomas Guardia got to be dictator of Costa Rica, he wrote to Don Enrique to build him a railroad. Meggs was busy in the Andes. A $75,000 contract was hardly worth his while, so he sent for his nephew, Minor Keith. They didn't let grass grow under their feet in that family. At 16, Minor Keith had been on his own, selling collars and ties in a clothing store. After that, he was a lumber surveyor and ran a lumber business. When his father bought Padre Island off Corpus Christi, Texas, he sent Miner down to make money out of it. Miner Keith started raising cattle on Padre Island and seining for fish, but cattle and fish didn't turn over money fast enough, so he bought hogs and chopped up the steers and boiled the meat and fed it to the hogs and chopped up the fish and fed it to the hogs, but the hogs didn't turn over money fast enough, so he was glad to be off to Limon. Limon was one of the worst pest holes in the Caribbean. Even the Indians died there of malaria, yellowjack, dysentery. Keith went back up to New Orleans on the steamer John G. Miggs to hire workers to build the railroad. He offered a dollar a day and grub and hired 700 men. Some of them had been down before in the filibustering days of William Walker. Of that bunch, about 25 came out alive. The rest left their whiskey-scalded carcasses to rot in the swamps. On another load, he shipped down 1,500. They all died to prove that only Jamaica Negroes could live in Le Mans. Minor Keith didn't die. In 1882, there were 20 miles of railroad built, and Keith was a million dollars in the hole. The railroad had nothing to haul. Keith made them plant bananas so that the railroad might have something to haul. To market the bananas, he had to go into the shipping business. This was the beginning of the Caribbean fruit trade. All the, work, all the while, workers died of whiskey, malaria, yellowjack, dysentery. Minor Keith's three brothers died. Minor Keith didn't die. He built railroads, opened retail stores up and down the coast in Bluefields, Belize, Le Mans, bought and sold rubber, vanilla, tortoiseshell, sarsaparilla, anything he could buy cheap he bought, anything he could sell dear he sold. In 1898, in cooperation with the Boston Fruit Company, he formed the United Fruit Company that has since become one of the most powerful industrial units in the world. In 1912, he incorporated the International Railroads of Central America, all of it built out of bananas. In Europe and the United States, people had started eating bananas, so they cut down the jungles through Central America to plant bananas and built railroads to haul bananas, and every year more steamboats of the Great White Fleet steamed north loaded with bananas. And that is the history of the American Empire in the Caribbean and the Panama Canal and the future Nicaragua Canal and the Marines and the battleships and the bayonets. Why that uneasy look under the eyes? In the picture of Minor C. Keith, the pioneer of the fruit trade, the railroad builder, in all of the pictures the newspapers carried of him, when he died, And I quote from Henri Ducard, 
from a famous movie you may have heard of a few years ago. The world is too small for a man like Bruce Wayne to simply disappear, no matter how deep he chooses to sink. If you make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to an ideal, and if they can't stop you, you become something else entirely. You become a legend, Mr. Wayne. Close quote. The world, according to John Dos Passos, again, much to his bitter chagrin, was too small for a man like Minor C. Keith. And maybe that's what gave him a sense of unease, coupled with the religious sense that every man must eventually pay cosmically for his sins, even though the temporal world may reward a man now for his crimes. This idea that Dos Passos explores in the story, very briefly there from 42nd Parallel, the vignette, really, of Minor C. Keith, this idea reveals the strain of Protestant moral ethic that filters throughout the entire USA series. Over the course of the 20th century, most average Americans would abandon this Protestant moral ethic in many different spheres after being repeatedly culturally flagellated by the literary and intellectual descents, descendants of John Dos Passos, Ernest Hemingway, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Dos Passos himself, however, would walk in the opposite direction, and this is one of the more fascinating things about John Dos Passos that is not reflected at 42nd Parallel, uh, 1919, or The Big Money, which are all books written by a more idealistic young man. And E.L. Doctoro points this out in his introduction to the 42nd Parallel by John Dos Passos, the Mariner Books edition here, and I quote from Doctoro, not until the Spanish Civil War but the profound difference between Dos Passos' humanistic ideals and the doctrinaire idealism of many of his contemporaries become clear. The visible moment of separation seems to have occurred with the execution in Valencia of his friend Jose Robles, a Republican by a communist firing squad. In his later life, Dos Passos was as archly conservative as he had been radical. What remained constant, like a moral compass course that never veered, was his despair of the fate of the single human being bent into the service of the institutions of modern industrial society, whatever those institutions may be. In fact, the pervading vision of USA is of a people dominated by institutions, which is to say, people trapped in history. The stature of USA was immediately recognized by the critics of the day. By the time of its publication as a completed one-volume trilogy in 1938, the novel was generally regarded as a major achievement, although displaying the characteristics of a highly controlled vision. Malcolm Cowley thought of it as, quote-unquote, a collectivist novel, perversely lacking the celebrations of common humanity that would be expected from a collectivist novel. Edmund Wilson, American writer and Marxist literary critic, wondered why every one of the ordinary characters of the book went down to failure, why nobody took root, raised a family, established a worthwhile career, or found any of the satisfactions that were undeniably visible in actual middle-class American life. Others objected to the character's lack of ideas. Dos Passos' refusal to give them any consequential thought or reflection not connected with their baser appetites close quote and it is this lack of balance that has fundamentally doomed the usa trilogy to not being read anymore and it is a series of books that every high school student should be reading just as at one time every high school student read the great gatsby and thus the usa trilogy and most of the rest of dos passos's canon has been delegated to the ash heap of history, literary history, and reading history itself. This is a fundamental problem, I think, with Dos Passos and his work. It's the, it's the kryptonite, it's the hook, it's the thing that's inside of the work, and leaders, you need to pay attention to this. This failure to recognize that people can become more than just a widget, quote-unquote, bent into the service of the institutions of the modern industrial society, whatever those institutions may be, this inability, this failure to recognize that people can become more, that the Marxist literary critic pointed out, 
and the failure of Dos Passos to recognize in his writings that average Americans did in the past and still do in the now actually, quote, find any of the satisfactions that were undeniably visible in actual middle class American life actually wonderful. This failure to recognize that people find those small things to be wonderful is a failure not only of Dos Passos's class, but it is a failure of his towering literary intellect. This inability to recognize the small, the banal, and the seemingly meaningless as equally heroic as the efforts of the saints painted large in socialist idealistic murals by Mexican artists has been a continuing conceit of the educated academic and cultural elite. And it has blinded them. And this is a point I made in my last shorts episode. Uh, you should go check that out. Episode number 44. It has blinded the elites like the roving eye of Sauron from high on Mount Doom in Mordor in Lord of the Rings. It has blinded them to the heroic leadership of the hobbits scrambling around in their midst. And in many cases, tragically, this willful blindness has blinded the hobbits as well. So, this was an introduction to 42nd Parallel, um, a book almost without a plot. And if you go and read some of the critiques of 42nd Parallel by more modern readers from the earlier part of this century, the 21st one, you, you do realize or, or you do get the sense that people are, get frustrated with this novel because it is a seemingly just wandering series of vignettes. And yet that's the point. It's a wandering series of vignettes. And so leaders, uh, when you pick up this book, I don't want you to be frustrated that it seems to be plotless meandering. Um, there's actually a point here, and it took me a little while to kind of, I'll be, I'll be honest, it took me kind of a little while to get into the speed of the book um, and to get into the speed of the trilogy itself. Because it is an, 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 an epic American trilogy, and we will talk more when we get to 1919 about the structure of the trilogy. So uh, please follow along. Now, I didn't read the whole book. I really just picked three different examples of character studies in the book. And, and this is what Dos Passos is really doing. He's building a character study. But the point of this podcast is what leaders can learn from leadership, right? So the question I always ask at the end of these solo episodes, uh, which are just really much longer versions of my shorts episodes with a few more graphics on the YouTube channel, the, the question here, if you've made it this far, is what is the point for leaders? How do they stay on the path leveraging Dos Passos? Is there anything that we can pull from this progressive intellectual giant um, whose books are no longer read, whose voice has fallen out of the canon? Maybe because everything that he wanted, he got, just like Nietzsche, who's also never talked about anymore. What can we learn from this fellow? Well, I think there's a couple of things we can learn. I think we can learn that leadership is about being about being part of building something, but it's also about being part of the unwinding of something. Four thoughts to take away from the 42nd parallel and 
we'll expand on some of these as we go into 1919 and finally end with the big money in our three-part series here on John Dos Passos' The USA Trilogy. Um, first thought, leaders must be comfortable with being forgotten. It's okay to not remember, and it's okay to not be remembered. The hubristic moment of our time is that because we have managed to record ourselves as average human beings on social media, we think that we will be remembered as we were, and in reality, all that will be left will be our highlight reels and our avatars. And then they will pass into history. It will pass into forgetting on the internet. Leaders, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't fall for the scam. Don't believe that because you posted something on Facebook or you've been tweeting ever since 2008, that any of that's gonna matter to people 100 years from now and that your voice won't just ascend into the mass of other voices and become innocuous and forgotten. The second idea that we can take from Dos Passos is that there's more than just politics in the world. There has to be. Um, leaders, the personal is not political. The personal is personal and the political is political. And for too long, we have conflated those two realms together. For too long, we have allowed Caesar into the realm of what is God's. And we have placed God outside the realm of everything. No, no, no. This will not do. Leaders, your job is to construct a hierarchy where everything has its place. And yes, there are boundaries, and I'm a man of boundaries. My, my big five personality traits indicate that <laughs> I'm high. I have a high degree of conscientiousness, and so I believe in boundaries. Uh, and if you don't, if you're a person who's more open, you have to admit that a riling mass of everything, all boundarylessness, all boundaryless and, and mushing together doesn't lead to innovation. It leads to chaos. So there's more than just politics in the world. Everything is not political. I think even Dos Passos would agree with that. The third point is that hierarchies are hard to climb. Leaders, I here's a secret, and I know you know it, but I'm just going to say it out loud here on the podcast. No one cares how hard your climb up the hierarchy was. I know you know this. People's eyes glaze over when you start talking about how hard your climb was up the hierarchy. People like it origin story, skip over the hard part, and then get to the top. <laughs> they don't want to know about the messy middle. <laughs> no matter what YouTube tells you. They don't want to know about the messy middle. They don't want to see the sausage getting made. Leaders, when you climb to the top of that hierarchy, understand that yes, the climb is hard. And understand that no one really cares about how you clawed up in the middle of the journey. They want to know where you came from. And they want to know where you wound up. And they want to miss the messy middle. Now, there may be lessons for your followers in that messy middle. Just like there are lessons in the messy middle between Eleanor Stoddard becoming and Eleanor Stoddard fully on the come. But you may want to mold those details. It's a dichotomy. You have to decide how much to give and how much to hold back. And it varies from leader to leader. Finally, the fourth thing we can pull from Dos Passos' work, beginning in 42nd parallel but continuing through the big money, is that leaders who lead other leaders become legends, Mr. Wayne. This is not about not being forgotten. This is about leaving an impression. This is about building up or tearing down. This is about making sure that the people who matter remember who you were. And I don't mean remember in terms of the internet or remember in terms of social media. I remember, I, 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 I make this point in terms of interpersonal interactions. The exchange that you do between yourself and your followers is what creates your legend. And then they go off and tell other people, and they go off and tell other people, and that's how the thing spreads. But most of the time, you won't become a legend. And most of the time, much of the time, you may not get to lead other leaders. So you're going to have to do something different. I think you're going to have to commit to an ideal. 
and you're going to have to decide that they cannot stop you. And the they, the eponymous they, the all-encompassing global they, well, they are always out there, and they are always seeking to tarnish your legend. And they are always seeking to stop you. But you've got to keep your ballasts. You've got to pay attention with an uneasy eye. And you have to be willing to, at the end of the day, potentially fade to the background of the idealist mural. And that's it for me. Well, if you liked that video, you should check out more by subscribing to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast playlist here on the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel. You can also get a copy of my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation for Intentional Leadership, co-written with Bradley Madigan. Check that out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere where you get ebooks today. And thanks.